Okay, our final speaker in the session is Peter Sorger. He is um, currently the Otto Crayer Professor of Systems Pharmacology and uh, founding head and director of the Harvard Program in Therapeutic Sciences and Laboratory for Systems Pharmacology. Um, Peter also formerly was on the faculty at MIT, and we'd like to welcome him back to participate in the symposium. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's a fantastic um, thing to be invited back across the river after nearly a decade of having been away. Uh, and I want to thank the organizers for, for having invited me. So um, I want to talk about uh, three related topics today, all of which has to do really with the impact uh, that variability plays uh, in therapeutic response. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit from the perspective of uh, clinical trials and clinical trial data. And I'm going to show you uh, some cellular data, so some ex vivo um, drug response data, and then finally end up um, sort of where we saw Michelangelo um, in working out new ways that we can actually go in and use tissue-based data to test uh, these therapeutic responses. Um, so I have uh, a couple of uh, disclosures here. Uh, some of the software um, that you're going to see me use is actually being uh, commercialized. So as most people are aware, um, the vast majority of cancers are actually treated with combination uh, therapies, either uh, chemotherapies classically, which can get up to six to eight or more in the case of uh, curative therapies, or in the more modern era with targeted therapies, typically two to three. Uh, and there's a fairly compelling rationale that's usually put forward. Uh, and in the case of cell autonomous therapies, for example, targeting oncogenes, uh, the usual argument that it has to do with the way networks are wired, either converging or parallel part, uh, pathways, and the analogy really is synthetic lethality. In the case of things um, that we heard about this morning from immunotherapy, the argument would have more to do with the way in which cells interact and the sort of multiplex, multidentate interactions here between uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. And we have a rather sort of precise analogy that's being made that I won't describe in detail, but I think is familiar to many of you, and that is two different ways of talking about drug interaction, which in essence have similar aspects to them, the so-called Leuve and Bliss models, and they presuppose that what we're doing by adding combinations of drugs is shifting, getting the drugs to interact together at individual cells, and then shifting the dose response behavior, the idea being that you both want potent molecules and they want, you want them to be highly efficacious. So uh, a couple of years ago, um, Adam Palmer in my lab and Ded Plana uh, thought it would be sort of interesting to see how this played out uh, in the context of, um, of human clinical trials. And so what they decided to do was to build as large uh, a database as possible of clinical trial results, which primarily consist of graphs that plot the fraction of patients relative to some measure of progression, either overall survival or progression-free survival. Uh, and it's a remarkable thing in this data-rich era that for the most part, none of this data is available uh, in digital form. But one of the great things about being at Harvard is that there are a lot of dusty journals lying around. So um, we went down into the basement, or Adam did, uh, and he simply processed all of these images and derived back out from them then the response distributions. And we're just about to uh, write, write up and publish this specific data set, but we have uh, now three or 400 clinical trials that have been uh, re-digitized in this way, in which we have some inference also over the, the uh, censoring events that take place. Um, we're also able to parameterize this, and one of the things you'll see play out is that response distributions on almost all arms of human clinical trials are long-tailed, so there's substantial benefit coming from those uh, in the outlier populations. So let's look at a, a, a really very, very famous, in this case, classic uh, combination immunotherapy. This combines PD-1 and uh, CTLA-4 inhibition that we heard about from Jim Allison earlier. Um, and uh, there are two arms to this trial, as shown here. Uh, the red patients and the blue, we don't imagine that they respond equivalently. But the general way we think about these trials then in combination, leading to this fairly significant increase uh, in 50% uh, progression out to 13 months, is that all patients are benefiting to some degree from each of the two drugs, from the red and, and the blue. Uh, so Adam uh, wanted to test a, a completely alternative hypothesis. What happens if you presuppose that, in fact, the only benefit that these patients were receiving was from one drug or the other, so that there's concentrated benefit with some subset of patients benefiting from A and B, and in fact, no drug interaction whatsoever. And you would, in fact, then predict, uh, based on a fairly simple empiric model, uh, 
uh, the, uh, the, the gray response distribution here. So in fact, actually, we've now gone back and looked at this much larger set of data and really recovered now from the 1940s the earliest possible hypothesis for how ca combination chemotherapy worked, and that's really due to James uh, Gadam and his colleagues. And uh, what he pros really guessed was that combinations were dealing with our inability, even in stratified, what we now think of as stratified patient populations at the time, it was disease uh, specific to actually identify responders and not, and so we're hedging our bets. Emil Fry had a, another hypothesis that I think is attractive today in terms of combination therapy interacting on different subparts of heterogeneous tumors, and it's only fairly recently that this sort of synergy idea has come to dominate our thinking. And so the hypothesis that Adam sort of recovered there was really the GADAM hypothesis. What's new, of course, is you have some opportunity to begin to test these ideas, uh, and we've done this now in collaboration with Novartis from data from Gao et al., this extraordinary PDX data set uh, that they created, in which you can now take from any uh, population of patients, and they looked at a, a wide range of tumor types, several thousand mice. You can then take each individual tumor, put it into individual mice, and then compare directly therapeutic responses, and you can do that over uh, different subpopulations. And that allows you to begin to see how this independent action mechanism could begin to work. Uh, so let's uh, look at these uh, gastric cancer genographs. They're going to be treated with uh, two different drugs individually. Um, so if you have the uh, PI3 kinase inhibitor and you now stack the response, so the longer the green bar, the better in this case, the longer progression-free survival. And then we'll just overlay on it what happened uh, in the case of the second drug, in this case, an experimental FGF inhibitor. And you'll see that there's really very weak correlation. That's generally true through uh, almost all of the human clinical and uh, PDX data that we see. And so you might be a very poor responder, in this case, uh, to the green drug and a good responder to the pink. And that effect alone is sufficient to actually lead to a net uh, clinical benefit from the combination of the two. And in fact, this is highly statistically meaningful. And if you go through and actually begin to now uh, look at human clinical trials here, a whole series, we've, as I've said, we've got about 40 of them where we have matched arms. Um, you can now see the predicted benefit uh, that you would see and the observed benefit. And for two-thirds of human clinical trials we've looked at, in fact, the combination benefit is sufficiently explained by the simplest of all models. Namely, there is no subtle pharmacological interaction. Instead, you're hedging your bets over which patient is going to respond. Uh, and that's particularly true, it turns out, in the case of a checkpoint inhibitor trial. So checkpoint inhibitors either combined with each other or combined with standard of care, often small molecule therapy, um, in uh, most, the vast majority of cases we've looked at, in fact, meets this null hypothesis. Now there are, all, uh, I should point out, there are about a third of cases where this is not true, and here are just a couple of examples. Look at the pancreatic cancer on the far right. What you have is two individual agents that are relatively in inactive. So in this case, the observed and the predicted benefit um, are very different from each other. Two inactive agents by independent action don't work any better together than individually the black line, whereas the observed benefit uh, is, is, is the red, excuse me, is the blue. So as a consequence, there certainly are exceptions. Um, but increasingly, we've become concerned about combinations here now, uh, a three-way combination, immunotherapy plus two um, uh, small molecule drugs I'll say more about in just a moment. Uh, that there was great excitement about three papers in Nature Medicine. And in fact, these are very substantially inferior to being able to go in and give the patients individually the correct medicine. So a number of questions arise. I want to talk at the end a little bit about how now you can stratify these populations to actually improve outcome. But we were equivalently interested in the question, how is it that what we think of as synergistic drug interactions, so I'm looking here at RAF and MEK inhibitors, so two drugs that work on successive parts of the canonical MAPK signaling pathway here, shown in the little picture from the New England Journal. It's hard to believe that those, in fact, aren't working synergistically. It's how they are described in the literature. And so we've gone back and actually, this is one among a series of these uh, that we started to reconstitute again ex vivo. And the hero in this story, in a sense, is Neil Rosen and his colleagues, who had shown that when uh, melanoma cells taken out uh, into the dish and then are examined for the time course of drug response, what they had found, uh, that there's this adaptive response. And the adaptive response is a condition of the cell where it can slowly divide under conditions where 
there is continuing action of the drug against the oncogene, in this case, uh, RAF inhibition. And this has been picked up by two postdocs in the lab, Luca Garosa and Fabian Froelich. And uh, a slightly more detailed representation of this showing here is one starts off with an initial population of cells. To the extent possible, we grow these uh, to be clonal and therefore genetically very similar. If you then add an inhibitor of this oncogenic pathway, and this is broadly true, what you will see is fractional kill, and there will be some survivors. Not yet known, but we think it may be true that this is the basis of residual disease. If you keep the drug around, you can actually grow these surviving cells. They divide extremely slowly, about five times more slowly than the starting population. You can keep them around, actually, for months. Um, and then if you decide to go on holiday and you take the drug away, in seven to nine days, they'll actually revert back to the starting condition. And they're indistinguishable, both in terms of phenotype with respect to drug response and in terms of transcript profile. So you have this transiently heritable adapted phenotype uh, that Neil and his colleagues first described. And one of the great mysteries of this population is we think this cell type needs MAPK activity to divide. So how is it surviving? And the hypothesis that's been out there so far is that, well, they can tickle by with just a little bit of the necessary pathway. Um, but what Luke and Fabian have now done is actually uh, pulled this out now into single cell analysis. So what you're looking at are labeled cells where we can measure the activity, in this case, of the output of the pathway uh, by fluorescence, and we can actually look at localization. You're seeing uh, automated cell tracking to the right of the picture, and down below you're seeing the activity of ERK in a single cell level. And what we see is, in fact, that these cells pulse, and they turn on only about 1% of the time but when they do so, they make all of the proteins that are necessary for them to undergo cell division. So in fact, this adapted cell state is turned off the oncogenic pathway, and then it's pulsing, and not shown here, but con really compatible with the things that Todd Golub and colleagues have phone is that is a microenvironment-based signal. So what could actually be going on? Uh, the remarkable thing in these now drug-adapted MAP kinase-dependent uh, melanomas is that they have two pathways made up of the same basic proteins, and it has to do with the way they assemble. And one of the pathways shown here in gray is the oncogenic pathway, and the other one is its natural variant, the one that mediates receptor signaling. And what uh, computational modeling, and I'm showing the model, we've recapitulated this the way a chemical engineer would do, and so we can trace the pathway all the way through. To the right, you're seeing in those lines that are semi-intelligible, absolute quantitative proteomics, where we have number of copies per cell. And what we're able to show through this is that the, you can be fully repressed for the oncogenic arm, that's why this is a useful therapeutic, even as you remain fully sensitive to this pulsatile extracellular arm that operates in this case uh, through a different assembly of these same RAF, ERK, and MEK molecules. But well, what does this have to do with what I've been telling you so far? Well, the remarkable thing is that when you now have a microenvironmental signal, you actually see that RAF inhibition sensitizes that to that signal. So here we're looking at dose response. The oncogenic arm is in black, either for RAF inhibitors or MEK inhibitors. And in color, uh, in the orange now, is the, uh, is the adapted pulsing arm. And you can see that the drugs, in fact, you actually get a worse pulse out of RAF inhibition, and that's because you've turned off negative feedback on this pathway, and out of MEK, you've shifted a hundredfold uh, in dose response. And you can now look at how these two DRACs uh, interact through what's called isobolagram analysis, so this is essentially the Leuve interaction hypothesis, and what we see is at very low dose, these drugs are additive, not synergistic, but critically, as you get into the clinical dose, they actually act as independent agents. So there's much more to tell of this story, but I think the most significant aspect of it is now when we go back and we re-dissect some of these combination agents that we've thought about two parts of a pathway, knock out one leg and the other leg, we actually see they interact at a mechanistic level in a very subtle fashion that itself does not have the pharmacology ascribed to them. So this is no means a proof of what I've shown you in the clinical data, but at least it's much more consistent than we thought of before. So the underlying story behind having a heterogeneous response in, in the clinical setting, the independent action hypothesis I've put forward, is that we're going to need much more sophisticated stratification in order to improve therapy. 
And one of the predictions of that, and you can show this to be true in the mice, is that if you withdrew the ineffective arm, in fact, you'd get just as good response. So imagine we're now in PD-1 CTLA-4 inhibitor that we heard about this morning. If a patient's responding primarily to one, you could withdraw the other arm and then dose escalate it, so with substantial benefit. And so what we've now tried to do is set out to actually measure drug interaction in patients on a routine basis. Um, and I'll just show you one data set that we have from melanoma in which we have patients uh, who've gone on to the therapy I just showed you, raf therapy, and they've then bi been biopsied every few weeks. And another set of patients uh, who were biopsied both during remission on these therapies and then post-progression. And this work was done by Ben Izar, the same extraordinary oncologist who Aviv credited in her work as well. And we wanted assays now that could be done on any routine clinical specimen, exactly um, um, what you heard about from, from the first talk in this section. So we have surgical resections, core and needle biopsies, lavage, et cetera. Um, and what's been routinely available, of course, from this are H&E images. There's quite a lot of development of those now with image processing. Um, but we wanted the type of image where you could actually get deep molecular information. And so we've developed a method that you can do at home on your own microscope in the public domain. Well, we can do about 60 color imaging uh, through the cyclic process um, that Michael alluded to earlier. Uh, and that allows us now to build up high plex images. And in this thing, we're able to get through tens of millions of cells per week in dozens of clinical specimens um, using much what you heard before. Uh, one thing we can't yet do, I should say, is we can't yet use the very high resolution information. So I think surprising to many pathologists, and shown on the right here, is that if you actually use high resolution microscopes, like the ones that are, are here at MIT, you would in fact be able to see every piece of information you've ever seen in a tissue culture cell. You can see mitotic fibers, you can see individual vesicles. And we don't yet know how to use that morphology-based information. Um, so most of what we've been doing is doing uh, a cell type and census, here you can see an immune cell gallery, that's an image review, and that comes directly out of, uh, in this case, a skin biopsy and resection specimen of early melanoma. So if you now look at that data in sort of data space, um, you can see the immune cells uh, on the lower left, if you look at the left-hand panel here is labeled with S100. Uh, as Dana pointed out, there are a lot of immune cells in this, the tumor cells live in the upper right-hand corner. And now for this single patient, we can see the progression uh, from the pre-treatment state to the on-treatment and the post-progression state and begin to follow the trajectory of that progression. Uh, one thing we see consistent with single-cell sequencing data that Aviv and colleagues have done is that the resistance mechanisms that come up are fractional. So here, one of the known pathways involves NGF, and in this single patient, it actually is only about a quarter of all the cells in the single resection that have that one uh, resistance mechanism. But I think what surprised us more than anything in this kind of histological data is really the diversity of response. And this is that TISNY plot that Dana described, now shown over all patients, color-coded uh, by where they were in their response profile. And this begins to resemble what we've seen from single-cell sequencing. And that is to say, even though we have now a biomarker stratified population on a single therapeutic regimen, we have a highly stereotyped biopsy routine. What we see is, in all cases, the drug did what it did, should do. It turns off MAPK signaling. But all the other things, the amount of immune infiltration, the way in which the stroma responded, was in fact patient idiosyncratic. And we think this type of behavior is going to be very hard to predict ab initio from knowledge of the gene sequence, and therefore could instead be assayed subsequent to therapy uh, using routine uh, techniques. So the last one I want to show you that really derives from uh, Oliver Jonas um, and that we're now imaging is a small device about a millimeter long, actually four millimeters long, that looks a bit like a golf peg, can contain 20 to 30 different drugs in it, can be inserted directly into a solid tumor, and releases from that local environment a series of potentially therapeutic molecules. We can recover that biopsy and image it in high dimension, um, and from that we ought to be able to derive what is the drug concentration, so the pharmacokinetic parameters, as well as the effect on a patient. And this opens then, I think, the opportunity for a kind of post-therapy and effective assay. So let me just leave you with the thought that the way we get cancer precision medicine handed to us from the NCI is very much the idea that we have heterogeneous populations, of course. We're going to sequence those patients up front. And from that, using um, various methods we've heard about today, we're going to end up with a predictor for which drug to give them.
And I want to suggest a complementary and potentially alternative approach. We're certainly going to want to know the gene sequence. We get Oncopanel or its equivalent for most patients now. Um, but we're going to put them onto therapies that could be combinations in which they benefit from only one of the two drugs. And I would put forward the hypothesis that we are really only a few years away now from routinely deploying these highly multiplexed assays, because in a clinical setting, you can actually take a pathology-based assay and move it back clinically as a so-called laboratory-developed test um, fairly rapidly. Um, we don't only want empiric predictors in this case, in this here now helping this patient uh, decide between the green and the pink drug, but in fact, we want to build out a network understanding, and I think you've seen exemplars of that today. So let me just conclude this sort of quick survey of tissue cells and patients um, to start off with the, the observation again that many successful combination therapies do not in fact involve drug interaction, and they arise because we have really poor uh, information about the diversity of response and we can't predict, so they're really bet hedging exercises. That shouldn't be seen as a negative because in fact um, these FDA approved therapies substantially improve outcomes, but what we need is much better stratification. I think we over-focus on this concept of pharmacological interaction and drug synergy. We're unable to reproduce it even preclinically in many of the settings in which it's been described, largely because drug interactions are time-dependent and they also have these cell extrinsic effects. And then finally, we think something like highly multiplexed imaging of the type that I showed you or you heard earlier uh, in this session will allow us to routinely access at a molecular level pre- and post-treatment biopsies and then uh, enhance therapy by sequencing patients appropriately onto the drug which is best for them. So I want to uh, thank all the people in this lab that we've set up. It has 16 investigators, including happily several from, from MIT, and if anyone's interested, come and join us. And the specific work uh, comes from the individuals I showed here, many of whom I've called out as I've gone along. Thank you. <laughs>